How are we doing, family? Good, thanks. Um, now, this is Nathan Thompson, the owner of the largest Flat Earth Facebook group on the internet. And today we are going to be helping him by addressing some of the misconceptions he's got about science. But before we do that, I want to clear up a little bit of confusion from the last video, which I have linked in the description. Um, let's have a look at this. So, a flat earther took this photograph of a tower and then climbed up 20 feet and took this photograph of a tower. As we can see, the second photograph has a much, much higher horizon. He claimed that was because the earth was flat and I claimed it was because he was tilting the camera down. So to prove he was tilting the camera down, I counted these things which I called steperunas. And in the first picture I could see seven steperunas and in the second picture I could see eight steperunas, proving that the camera had been tilted downwards in that second picture. Now, the reason I counted those step runners was to show that the camera must have been tilted down in that second photograph, which is why the horizon was higher in the frame of the photograph. What I wasn't implying was by tilting the camera down, he made the horizon higher than the tower. Uh, I think a little bit of confusion crept in, so I want to clear that up. Anyway, Nathan Thompson, he has, how should we say, a scattergun approach to his flat earth debates and his videos, where he will recite question after question after question without waiting for any sort of answer. So I'm going to help him out today by taking a recent video he's done and answering the first 10 questions for him. So let's get started. You got basically second law of thermodynamics is entropy. And you couldn't have pressurized air next to a vacuum. Now, firstly, the second law of thermodynamics does not in any way contradict us having uh, an atmosphere next to the vacuum of space. What we've got to remember, which is where you're confused, Nathan, is the second law of thermodynamics is about the movement of energy and not the movement of matter. And what we have to remember is the particles that have made it that high up in the atmosphere have already done so much work against gravity and radiated off so much of their energy as heat that they have almost no energy left whatsoever. And given the fact that these particles now have such little energy, it's a very easy job for gravity to keep those particles from exploding off into space. Let's take your second question. Second, we've got <clears throat> accelerometers. Accelerometers in your phone are calibrated on a level plane of existence and never, ever have detected Earth rotation, Earth's movement, anything. Well, Nathan, mobile phones will measure the 9.8 meters per second squared towards the center of the Earth. However, if you're talking about rotation, well, the Earth spins so slowly that the resolution of these phones just won't cut it. In fact, the Earth's rotation is so slow that it will actually have less of an effect on the accelerometer than everyday electrical noise. So ultimately, Nathan, what we're saying is we just wouldn't expect a mobile phone to be able to pick up the rotation of the Earth. Number three. But when our water is at rest, it's flat and horizontal to its container. And so I think that's where we get the word horizon from because it's a horizontal line that rises to eye level, horizon. Well, firstly, a 15 second Google search tells me that the origin of the word horizon is absolutely not the fact that it's a horizontal line that rises to eye level. And the second thing is water will always respond to the forces applied to it. It will not always just simply lie flat. But then of course, I'm sure you're already more than familiar with images like that. So let's move on. Airplanes are not adjusting for curvature when they're flying. No, so what typically happens is that a plane will fly to a given altitude and it will remain at that altitude until it decides to come down on land. But to remain at that altitude, it has to constantly make minor adjustments against turbulence and air resistance. And those minor adjustments are actually so much bigger than the adjustments that you would need to make for the curvature of the Earth. So no, a plane won't fly a certain distance and then dip its nose a certain number of degrees just to account for the curvature of the Earth. The curvature of the Earth is accounted for by the very fact that it's trying to maintain its altitude and making these constant, constant adjustments all the time. Next point. The Elias effect, uh, ambient light from the firmament. Um, so there is a difference between sunlight and daylight. Look into it. Uh, sunlight is obviously hot. Uh, the sun is pyrophosphorescent, golden yellow. Its light is preserving and drying. And moonlight is cold, putrefying. Its light is uh, septic and moist. All right, there's a lot to take in there, so let's start with the Elias effect. Now, the Elias effect is something that's real. If I wanted to uh, sample a signal and reproduce it, if I didn't sample it at a high enough frequency, then what I might end up with is something which is not actually a copy of the signal I'm trying to sample. Like in this picture here, where I'm trying to sample the signal at the bottom, but because my sampling frequency is too low, I actually end up creating the signal we see at the top. Now, a good rule of thumb to avoid this from happening is to make sure that the sampling frequency you use is about twice as high as the highest frequency you're gonna find in the signal. Now let's move on to the moonlight versus sunlight argument. 
William Herschel was one of the very first, if not the first, scientists to open our eyes up to the world of the electromagnetic spectrum. He showed us by splitting sunlight into a spectrum of colours that each colour had different properties, each colour had a different temperature. And he also placed thermometers outside of that spectrum and discovered the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Since then, of course, we've been able to identify all the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and they all have different properties. Now, what you've got to remember is the light coming from the sun contains the full spectrum from gamma all the way through to radio waves. And when that light hits something and reflects off it, depending on what that material is that it's reflecting off, that material will absorb different wavelengths. So in other words, the light reflecting off an object will have different properties to the light that hit that object in the first place. Now, we see this all the time. The very fact that things are different colours is evidence that they are absorbing different wavelengths of light and reflecting other wavelengths of light. So while I do agree with you that the Elias effect is real and that the light reflecting off the moon is going to be different from the light that comes from the sun, you have used those ideas so out of context to come up with such incredible conclusions that I have to wonder, have you ever actually read about the electromagnetic spectrum or the Elias effect yourself? Or are you just parroting this from somebody else? But let's move on. We get a sun analemma in the sky because uh, it's called northern and southern declination. The path of the sun and the moon are expanding and contracting around polar center. Um, so the center of the earth, that's where we get a yin and a yang symbol. Okay, the solar analemma is well explained using the heliocentric model. I have a couple of issues with yours. The first one is, I've heard you time and time again say that gravity is some kind of magical force that you can't believe in. Well, if you're going to tell me that you cannot believe in a magical force that has no evidence, then let me ask you, what magical force is taking that sun and making it move in a circle and then periodically expanding that circle and then contracting that circle again? What force is moving the sun? in your flat earth model. Now, another fantastic point made more recently by Professor Dave Explains is that if the sun is moving in these uh, circles of different circumferences, then either the speed of the sun has to be constantly changing to keep a day length at 24 hours, or the days will not remain at 24 hours. Now, we don't see the speed of the sun changing in the sky, but yet we do see 24 hours between sunsets. Another proof that the sun is small and localized is the uh, drastic temperature variations throughout the day. Now actually we don't have drastic temperature variations throughout the day. You may think that if we wake up in the morning and it's 5 degrees Celsius and then in mid-afternoon it's 20 degrees Celsius, you might think that's a big jump. But it's not four times bigger. We're not four times hotter at 20 degrees than we're at 5 degrees. And the reason for that is that zero degrees is not our starting point. If we're going to make judgments on absolute temperature differences, we have to start from either minus 273 degrees Celsius or from 0 degree Kelvin and work in the Kelvin scale. And if we do the calculation properly, what we can see is going from 5 degrees in the morning to 20 degrees C in the afternoon is literally only a jump of about 5%. Now I'm assuming the reason you want to say we have big temperature changes is because you need a small and localised sun, which will give us big temperature changes as it passed overhead. But unfortunately that is not what we see, nor do we see an angular size reduction in the sun, which is what we'd have to see if your model was correct. Moving on. And also, if you look at fauna and flora, the climates and the plants and animal life, the fauna and flora, is much different in the northern regions than in the southern regions. Yeah, there's nothing like geographic isolation to promote speciation and evolution, but I'm not sure how that's related to the shape of the Earth. Next point. The average Antarctic temperature is negative 55 degrees. The average temperature in the Arctic is negative 5 degrees. Now, I'm not really sure why you think this is evidence for flat Earth or evidence against the globe. But yeah, there is a massive difference in temperature between the Antarctic and the Arctic. But the reasons are well documented and easy to understand. For example, the Antarctic has an elevation going up to about two miles, where it's going to be incredibly cold. Also, the Arctic is kept warmer by the heat transfer from the Arctic Ocean. And I could go on. There are a whole host of reasons that explain that temperature difference perfectly. But I am a little confused as to what that's got to do with the shape of the Earth. Then you got the Antarctic Treaty, which states... Oh, drop the ball! I will not laugh at your drop balls. So what else we got on the flat stationary Earth? There is no proof of Coriolis. To just claim there's no proof of the Coriolis effect is really, really weak. We all know that in the Northern Hemisphere, storms rotate in the opposite direction to the Southern Hemisphere. And we all know about Foucault's pendulum. And if you don't, it's a lovely little demonstration to demonstrate that the Earth is rotating. But one little interesting fact I found out about the Coriolis effect was that by World War II, the uh, technology that the Nazis were using in long-range warfare had actually improved to the point where they could fire heavy missiles about 70 miles. 
But they had to, because they were using those longer distances, they had to take into effect the Coriolis effect. And then we can add to that these little fellas that are gyro compasses, which work not on magnetic fields, but purely by their ability to identify the axis of spin on the Earth. And these things are used all the time in navigation, in the real world. Crepuscular rays, um, to me, show a small localized sun with rays that are converging towards one central point above the clouds. So crepuscular rays look like this, and they are formed when sunlight shines through gaps in the cloud. And they can appear to look as if they're not parallel, and if you were to follow them, they'd converge at a point not too much higher than the clouds themselves. Just in the same way that these train tracks here appear to converge, but we know that's not true. And if we were to simply stand to the side of the train tracks, we could see that they are absolutely parallel. And the same is true with crepuscular rays. In fact, if we were to look at a cloud from above, when crepuscular rays are being shown below, we would see that the, the rays themselves and the shadows cast by the cloud are absolutely parallel. So ultimately, my answer to that is our favourite flat earth word ever, perspective. Now, I will be helping Nathan Thompson in the real world very soon when I debate him on Simon Dan's channel. I hope Nathan, you're watching this and it's done you some good, but more than that, I hope people that follow you on Facebook and follow you on YouTube have watched this to show that the scattergun approach where you just shout out what you claim to be 10, 15, 20 proofs in one minute um, actually falls apart when you give someone time to actually look at those claims. And that's what we'll be doing in our debate. So I look forward to helping you and your subscribers even more. Goodbye.